Hello you, my name is Lauren Layfield and this is your next podcast. The show that podcast fans everywhere have been waiting for. Maybe you're pretty new to the podcast world and you're sort of struggling to find new shows to try or perhaps you're always trying to convince your mates to get into podcasts, right? But you need some good recommendations up your sleeve to persuade them. Well, don't worry, let me do the hard work for you. Every week, I'll bring you the first episode of an amazing podcast which I have personally tried and tested, ready for you to get stuck into. Plus, if you follow your next podcast, more great suggestions will appear in your favorite podcast app and you'll automatically create a fail-safe list of five-star shows to pick from. So no more scrolling for you. This week, the show I'm recommending is The Missing, hosted by writer and journalist Pandora Sykes. It's an almost unbelievable fact that in Britain alone, someone is reported missing every 90 seconds. Can you believe that? Most are thankfully found, but The Missing tells the stories of the 1% of cases which remain unsolved. This show is now in its fifth season and it is completely addictive. Each week, Pandora tells the story of a person who has gone missing through interviews with their family and friends. It's a haunting show in some ways because it does leave you with so many unanswered questions. Yeah, so she decided to go back home and wait for him or see if he'd already gone home and he he just didn't come back. The show is made in association with charities who search for missing people and the hope is that the episodes keep some attention on the cases. So by listening, you do feel that maybe just maybe you could help someone to be found which would be amazing the episode i'm going to play you right now is the first in the fifth season and it's all about a man called stephen clark who vanished on a walk with his mum when he was 23 years old most of us are brought up to trust the police We're told as children that if we're ever in distress and that our parents aren't around, we should look for a policeman. That if we find ourselves in a dangerous situation, the sound of sirens and the sight of blue flashing lights means help is at hand. Don't ever talk to strangers, but you can always speak to the police. That's how Stephen and Victoria Clark were raised. In fact, they had more cause to place their faith in the authorities than most, given that their parents, Charles and Doris, were former police officers themselves. But one morning in September 2020, something happened which forever changed the family's relationship with the authorities. Victoria, now grown up and living in Northumberland with her husband and two young children, heard a knock at the door. She excused herself from the conference call she was on and was greeted by the sight of two solemn-faced officers. They asked her if she was Victoria Orr, the daughter of Charles and Doris Clark. She nodded and the next words out of their mouths knocked her world off its axis. They informed Victoria that her parents had been arrested. The reason? They were suspects in her brother Stephen's murder. The same brother who had vanished without a trace during a seaside walk with his mother almost three decades earlier. I'm Pandora Sykes and you're listening to The Missing, a Podomo podcast series produced by What's The Story Sounds and brought to you with help from the charities Missing People and Locate International. They believe that all of the cases in this series could still be solved. This is The Missing, Stephen Clark. Victoria remembers the last time she saw her brother Stephen, like it was yesterday. I had gone up to um, my mom and dad's house to spend Christmas with my family Uh, So that was December 1992. 
and um, we we just had a, a regular Christmas. Just you know, we enjoyed being together as a family. We'd all kind of sit around the table, have dinner that lasted for hours, chats. Um, you know, drink wine and just have a really nice sort of family time. Stephen lived with his parents in their home in Mask by the Sea, North Yorkshire. Victoria was based in Guildford, about six hours away by train, but she made regular trips to visit her family and looked forward to reuniting with them at Christmas time, especially. Stephen and I went to the movies, which we did quite a lot together we went to the pub and you know went for walks on the beach and um, just hang out and listen to music and stuff like that. Stephen was 23 and studying computing at college. Just 14 months separated the siblings in age Stephen being the eldest of the two and the pair of them were inseparable. One morning we were sitting in the kitchen at my mom and dad's house sitting around the table and he said to me if you were going to kill yourself, how would you do it? And I looked at him and I said to him in a, such a flippant way, I don't know, but if you do it, can I have your hi-fi? And we just laughed. We had this kind of dark sense of humor that we would just, you know, probably be a bit inappropriate at times. But it was just one of those for me at the time, it was just one of those silly conversations. It didn't cross my mind that that might be something he would actually contemplate. And I still don't think it's something he would contemplate. But of course now I I play that conversation back um, quite a lot. Victoria had no reason to believe that her brother was serious. He'd always had an unconventional sense of humour, one which had its origins in a childhood tragedy. For all of my life, really, Stephen has been disabled. So when he was two, he was involved in a road traffic accident and he spent six weeks in a coma um, in hospital. And he was told, or my parents were told by the doctors, that he would would never talk, he would never walk, that uh, that sort of life for him was, was over. Stephen's parents were unwilling to accept their son's grim prognosis. Against all odds, he he recovered really well. And, you know, a lot of that was down to my mom and dad and the amount of support and help that they gave him in terms of physio and um, exercise and that sort of really positive outlook. But that didn't mean there weren't plenty of significant obstacles to overcome along the way. He couldn't use his left arm. He walked with a very um, pronounced limp. So he saw a lot of specialists over the years. So we spent a lot of time um, in and out of hospitals, you know, trying different um, treatments or different splints or, um, you know, sort of strengtheners on his, on his arm. More than anything, Stephen's sunny disposition, one shaped by his parents' seemingly bottomless reserves of optimism, helped him and his family to persevere. Stephen, as a person is a very enthusiastic, determined, um, outgoing, sort of happy-go-lucky and had a really positive mindset in terms of not letting his disability get in his way. And I think a lot of that was down to how we interacted as a family. You know, even though Stephen had challenges, we always tried to overcome them and tried to make sure that... um, that he lived as normal a life as possible. But the rest of the world wasn't always so kind. In the sort of 70s and 80s growing up um, with a disability, it was a very different world to the world that it is now. So, you know, we'd sometimes walk down the streets and I have a very vivid recollection of walking down the streets with Stephen um, and um, being very small and having and noticing, being aware of people staring at him. Um, And I have a memory of walking in front of him and sticking my tongue out and pulling faces so that people would look at me instead of him. And then another memory of being in a playground one time, meeting some kids that we hadn't met before. And one of the little boys saying, saying to my brother, what's wrong with you? And I kind of looked at him and said, don't you know that's rude? What's wrong with you? 
Stephen and Victoria spent the first few years of their lives in the UK. But then their parents decided that a change of scenery was in order. And a drastic one at that. My dad went to South Africa on a work trip and he called my mom and said, this is just paradise. And so that was the, that was the result. That's where we went. I think at the time my mom and dad were looking, they, they felt like living in the sun and being in the sunshine would be beneficial um, for, for Stephen. Yeah, so, and, you know, Stephen and I became South African citizens, so it became home. Stephen and Victoria spent their formative years living in Spinoni, outside of Johannesburg. It was a big adventure, you know, we lived in a warm country, we had a swimming pool in the garden, we had a big group of friends, you know, so we had a, we had a really good childhood. South Africa felt less like a new country and more like a whole other planet. Every day brought something new and exciting to explore. We'd go on holiday to Durban or to Cape Town and I can remember Stephen and I would be swimming in the beach um, during the day and then at night we'd kind of walk along the beach and there would be shark fishermen, you know, people kind of bringing sharks in and we saw sharks kind of lined up on the beach at one point hammerheads and um, and different types of sharks and we'd be like no there's no way we're getting back in that water again tomorrow but of course the next day would come and we'd be back in the water so you know lots of lots of nice happy uh, memories as Stephen and Victoria entered adolescence their differing personalities began to emerge Stephen was definitely the louder one you know, he would be much more of an extrovert than I would be. He, he was always the louder one, but I think we complemented each other pretty well. But despite Stephen's growing confidence and ever-increasing mobility, there was still the occasional bump in the road. And at the age of 13, Stephen moved into a, a special needs um, school. And part of that was because he was, he was just struggling academically to keep up at the same pace so my parents had spoken to the school and had lots of meetings etc and he ended up going into um, a special needs school which was a really difficult time um, for him and a difficult time for all of us actually because he struggled in that school it was you know he was English speaking South African from an English background and the school was Afrikaans and his his grasp of the Afrikaans language wasn't great. So he struggled and he was bullied quite a bit in that school. So it was, it was quite um, a difficult time for him. But um, he studied and studied and studied. And um, my mom sat with him for hours every night doing homework and preparing for exams. Victoria vividly remembers the day the examination results were due. The entire household was on tenterhooks, racked with nervous anticipation. Back in those days, they used to post the results in the newspaper. So you'd go and buy the newspaper and sort of scan the newspaper looking for your name. Um, and his, you know, he was, he was obviously in the newspaper with his matric results. And, um, and we, we celebrated that day because it had been such a struggle for him he had to put in so much effort to do it and to get there but he did and that's a, a real kind of testament of the type of person that he is the family were overjoyed at Stephen's success but several years after graduating Stephen was yet to find work and it wasn't for lack of trying in South Africa in those days, having a disability wasn't very accepted. People were kind of, you know, not accepted into society as much. So it was difficult to find, to find work for Stephen, even though he had a good group of friends and a good social life. It was, finding work was a different story. So my mom and dad decided um, to move to the UK to give him a better chance of being able to live an independent life. For Stephen and Victoria, who had grown accustomed to having a pool in their back garden, life in the UK took some getting used to. 
It was a big culture shock. I mean, when we left South Africa, it was, I think, 34 degrees or something. And we arrived in like minus six and snowing. So that, on a, for a start, was, <laughs> was a big shock. And I guess everything was different. You know, the culture was different. We moved to Guildford um, because that's my dad was working uh, somewhere outside of London. And um, so Guildford is a commuter town. So we lived in Guildford and it was just challenging because we had to start all over again. Nevertheless, they threw themselves wholeheartedly into their new community and soon became deeply involved with an organisation known as FAB. So FAB um, stood for Physically Handicapped Able Bodied and it was a social group where people with disabilities could mix with people who didn't have disabilities and, you know, just to kind of create a more inclusive society. And again, you know, there was sort of charitable aspect. We do fundraising and what have you. But um, yeah, just meet up and um, hang out and go to events and had a great time. But then the family's fortunes changed. My dad lost his job. Um, he was made redundant. And um, so my mom and dad took the decision to move to the northeast where they're originally from and moved back to his hometown of Mask by the sea. So I was working in Guildford, so I stayed behind in Guildford uh, and Stephen moved with my mom and dad. So again, it was a bit more sort of upheaval, you know, and more, more change. The move to Mask put over 250 miles between Stephen and his sister, who had found a job as a receptionist in a hotel. But the siblings resolved to keep in touch. We didn't have mobile phones in those days or email or anything like that. But we would call each other. I would call home and speak to my mom and dad and speak to Stephen. And we used to write to each other. So I have a collection of letters from Stephen that are obviously very precious to me now. The last Christmas Victoria spent with her brother... Stephen filled her in on everything that had been going on since they'd last seen each other. He was excelling at college and had recently won Student of the Year. He had also joined a brass band and had even found time for a girlfriend. I'd gone back to Guildford after the Christmas break and gone back to work. And then I had a phone call from my mom or my dad. Again, I can't remember who it was that called me to say, don't worry but Stephen hasn't come home and, you know, we don't want you to panic, and, but we just want to, to let you know. But not panicking wasn't exactly in Victoria's nature. As a person, I'm a worrier, so I'm pretty sure I would have been very worried because it's so out of character for Stephen to do anything like that, you know? And, you know, I mean, Stephen was not a worrier at all. And he used to say to me, you know, if you worry, you die. And if you don't worry, you still die. So why worry? And he could never understand why I sort of <laughs> worried about things. So we were very different like that, you know. And I can remember going back on the train and um, some guy, a stranger, had said to me, um, you just look sadder than anyone I've ever seen. Um, and, yeah, that conversation stuck with me. Over the phone, Victoria's parents filled her in on what had happened. So Stephen was supposed to be going to a um, football match with my dad. Um, and, you know, my dad's a big Middlesbrough supporter. Stephen, Stephen was not. Um, he was an Arsenal supporter. So... He decided not to go and he decided not to go because my dad had said to him, if you want to come, you can buy your own tickets. And, you know, there's been quite a lot of stuff read into that um, that I've read about in the press. But, you know, Stephen was 23 years old and, you know, part of and I do this with my kids, you know, part of kind of 
learning about money and independence is that you, your parents don't always pay for you <laughs> to go everywhere, you know. So Stephen decided, and Stephen was quite tight with money, um, so he was very he was very careful. Like I was a splurger. If I had money, I would just spend it on whatever you know as soon as i had it it was gone but he was a saver so he um he was very very careful um with his cash so for whatever reason he decided not to go so he went for a walk on the beach instead um with my mom it was the afternoon of december the 28th a monday and they walked along the beach from mask to saltburn and then Stephen decided he wanted to go into the toilets. It's about a mile walk, so it's quite understandable to want to go to the loo. So he went into the toilets, um, and my mom decided that, well, she'll go into the ladies, and that is the last that we, we saw of him or that she saw of him. When Doris came out, Stephen had yet to emerge from the bathroom, so she waited and waited, and waited, but her son never reappeared. A lot has been made of the fact that my mom didn't go in looking for him, but again, Stephen was 23 at the time. He was fiercely independent, and I think because of his disability, he was probably more um, independent, and he would have been mortified and really quite annoyed if my mom had gone into a public toilet um, looking for him. So, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. And now would you go in? Absolutely, you know, but that is the story. That is what, what happened. So she decided that, you know, he must have made his way back. And, you know, this is a walk that they would have done hundreds of times. So it wasn't a kind of one-off kind of walk along the beach. Exercise was really important um, for Stephen with his disability. So that walk on the beach was quite a regular um, walk. I've walked it with him many times. Yeah, so she decided to go back home and wait for him or see if he'd already gone home. And he, he just didn't come back. When Doris came home to an empty house, she started to worry. I was still in Guildford at this point, but obviously, you know, it got darker and there's still no sign of Stephen. So my mom and dad went out looking for him. And then obviously when I came up um, and they'd called the police. After years of taking witness statements themselves, the clerks found themselves on the other side of the fence. And as many families before them have found, and many will after, it is a frustrating place to be. The clerks were told that as Stephen was an adult, he would have to be missing for at least 24 hours before they could take action. Which is completely unhelpful because, you know, those, those early moments are the times when you want that awareness to be out there and try and find out, you know, where he was and, and what was happening. Um, so having to wait for a specific amount of time is just ridiculous, but that is what happens you know so yeah and then when I came up um when I got the train from Guildford um and went back up to the northeast we went out searching so one of us would stay in the house you know waiting for the door waiting for the phone to ring and the rest of us um the other two would be out searching, uh, walking along the beach with torches, calling for him, um, you know, walking around the towns, walking around the streets, just trying, looking everywhere, just trying to, trying to find him. Eventually, enough time passed for the police to get involved. But even then, there was very little for them to go on. Stephen didn't have his wallet, he didn't have his glasses, so he he didn't take anything that he would have needed. His bank account has never been touched. His national insurance number has never been used. His passport hasn't been used. So he has just vanished. As time ticked on, the Clark family waited with bated breath for news. A break in the case. Some sign. 
one single solitary clue that might shed some light on what happened to their son. But none came. There's no evidence. You know, there's there's nothing to suggest that he fell into the water. There's nothing to suggest that he got on a train. There's just no evidence. There's nothing. Um, so you're constantly looking. At, you know, I'd like watch... I don't know, rugby matches on TV and I'd be scanning the crowds and, you know, just you're, you're constantly looking. You're looking for a face in, in crowds all of the time, just hoping that you're going to spot him. Victoria had taken extended leave from work to be with her family and help with the search for her brother. But eventually she had to return to Guildford very strange going back into work into a kind of normal environment where nothing is normal anymore you know um so that obviously is challenging and uh, I I don't remember this but one of my friends said to me that when I when I got back I um I printed off hundreds and hundreds of posters missing posters and I went out and stuck them up everywhere and put them into shops and train stations and I have absolutely no recollection of doing that at all so I think it's you know you kind of existing in a bit of a a bubble What made this case so challenging was that there were no obvious leads. Stephen had last been seen going into the public toilets, and it was pretty clear that he was no longer there. So had he exited first and set off walking home and come to harm on the way? Had he taken ill and not emerged until some time later, after his mother had already set off walking home and then come to harm? Or had he met someone inside the toilets? There was no evidence for any scenario. Stephen's parents did everything they could to keep the search for their son alive, but it was harder and harder to get attention. Other cases would hit the headlines. Stephen's case became old news, and life carried on, just without Stephen around. lots of lots of things that they've tried over the years to to find Stephen you know there's so many newspaper reports um, where they've spoken to the press and the media and television appeals and just all sorts of things to try and find him which obviously makes what happened next even more unreal Years passed and Stephen's case fell further and further down the police's list of priorities. The media, having run out of angles on the grieving parents and their missing son, moved on. Then, one September morning, almost two decades after Stephen had disappeared, the Clark family found themselves suddenly thrust into the spotlight once again. I guess about two and a half years ago, Um, I was on a conference call with work and there was a knock at my front door. So I went to the door to open it and there were two detectives standing on the, on the doorstep, um, and, uh, and said to me, can we come in? And I had, you know, I mean, when, when you've got two detectives on your door asking to come in, you, you're really panicking about, you know, what's happened. And I'd just dropped my kids at school. So I knew they were there and they were safe. And I knew my husband was upstairs working in his office. And um, I thought, God, something's happened to my mom and dad. So I was already kind of on edge. Anyway, they walked in and they said to me, um, look, there's no easy way to say this, so we might as well just come out with it. We've just arrested your parents on suspicion of murdering Stephen. Victoria's heart dropped into her stomach. Had she been given a million guesses as to why the police were at her door, she could never have imagined this. I mean, it's... (laughs) you kind of you you see this kind of thing happening on tv but when it happens to you it's i felt like the whole world was spinning i just um i couldn't believe what i was hearing 
for her parents to be accused of murdering their son. A son who was a child they had accompanied on countless hospital trips and physio visits. A son they had uprooted their entire lives for, not once, but twice. A son they had always given total love and devotion. It wasn't just nonsensical, it was deeply, deeply offensive to Victoria, and her shock soon turned to anger. So my first response was, you know, wh- where are my, my mom and dad? Are, are they okay? Because, of course, I, I know that this whole thing is ridiculous. There's absolutely no way um, they would hurt Stephen because of the family that we have and the relationships that we have. So it was just utterly unreal. Anyway, they told me that they'd been arrested and taken to police cells for interviewing And then they said to me, we recognize that we never spoke to you at the time when Stephen went missing. So are you okay to do an interview now? And I said, yes, I can, of course. Do you want me to come down to the station? And they said, no, we've got the equipment here. We can do it here. Victoria sat down at her kitchen table with the two officers, where she was questioned for over four hours. It was just horrific. You know, and the whole time I'm panicking, thinking, well, I want to talk to my mom and dad. Like, what's, how are they? How are they coping? You know, they're in their 80s now. It's, you know, it's, (laughs) this is just a horrific shock. So it was the beginning of a very long nightmare. Not long into the interview, the subject turned to Victoria's parents and whether there was any history of violence in the household. They went about this questioning, you know, so so many times, um, asking about my childhood and that my mom and dad were violent, which is absolutely not the case and couldn't have been further uh, from the truth. So it was, you know, it was it was actually quite a terrifying experience. I was really quite traumatized by this. And I woke up um, for many, many months hearing the words that the police officers had said to me um, in the middle of the night. In Victoria's eyes, there was no way her parents could be involved, and she was insistent that nothing from her interview would give them reason to think otherwise. It was just awful. They just went on and on and on and on. And at the same time, I found out later, my parents were being interrogated in a police station And on the basis of what? I mean, you know, it it was just the most horrific situation and um, I wouldn't wish it on on my worst enemy. How had this happened? How had such an unassuming, respected couple, former police officers no less, who had already endured more than their fair share of tragedy, come to find themselves accused of such a heinous crime? Perhaps it can be explained by a piece of evidence uncovered in 1999. Seven years after Stephen first went missing, an anonymous letter was sent to the police, one which accused Stephen's parents of being complicit in his disappearance. From what I can gather, the strength of this arrest was based on that anonymous letter. But this person is not known to our family and didn't know Stephen. Roughly 12 weeks after Charles and Doris were arrested by the police, the writer of the anonymous letter came forward, 20 years after they had written it. And I mean, the, the letter even addressed to the police force, his, his name is wrong. It went to a different police force in Gisborough, which is not the police that were dealing with it. So why it was taken so seriously, I, I really don't know, but it has devastated our family. When the police finally left Victoria's home, she immediately tried to get in touch with her parents, but they were still in custody. Eventually, at 10 o'clock that evening, after spending an entire day fending off accusations that they had murdered their own flesh and blood, they were released on bail and phoned their daughter. So I spoke to them then, and they were just in a state of shock and they'd been pitted against each other as well you know it was just awful the way they were treated was 
was diabolical. My, my parents are actually in the process of a formal complaint against the police through their, through their solicitor. Um, and I think that's absolutely the right thing to do. But Charles and Doris's ordeal didn't end there. They then got a warrant to search my mom and dad's house and garden. And then they turned up one morning and told my mom and dad that they had uh, two hours, I think, to get out of the house because they were sending in um, forensics and diggers and what have you. So, I mean, at one point there were about nine police vehicles outside my mom and dad's house and a forensics tent up in the garden. They 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 dug up the garden, um, you know, looking for who knows what and, of course, didn't find anything. But this was in the middle of COVID as well. So we were in the middle of lockdown. My mom and dad had to go and stay in a hotel. They couldn't come and stay with me, even though I wanted them to, because it was against the rules and against the law. And, you know, they just didn't want any further kind of police scrutiny if we broke the rules by them coming to stay here with me. So they ended up staying in a hotel, you know, locally and just, and they were there for about five days. So just turfed out of the house and, uh, and then had everything dug up and, and rummaged through. So it was a very, very difficult um, time. And of course, of course, they didn't find anything. They took my mom and dad's mobile phones and iPads and they kept them for months and months and months. Like what on earth do they think they're going to find on them? Unsurprisingly, the arrests sent the media into a frenzy. Charles and Doris couldn't step outside without having multiple cameras and microphones shoved into their faces. A press pack descended on Victoria's home. Nothing was off limits, not even her children. My son was 13 at the time and he was um, contacted by a journalist. And it, it was awful. I mean, luckily, he, he just kind of put the phone down and then told me about it. So the next time they called, I, I answered. Um, and then, you know, I contacted the editor of the of the newspaper and they sent around Robin round telling them not to contact us again. But, you know, part of the comments that I would read online were like, well, where's Stephen's sister? Why isn't she speaking out? Why isn't she standing up for her mom and dad? And, you know, all of this kind of stuff, which was very difficult when I was trying to protect my children because I didn't want them to go to school and have a hard time or, you know, be bullied and what have you. So it's kind of, it's a bit of a balancing act, isn't it? You're trying to, you're trying to get everything right and sometimes feeling like you're getting everything wrong. Rather than strengthening their credentials and reputation to casual onlookers, the fact that Doris and Charles were both former police officers caused some to speculate that they had the necessary experience to cover their tracks. Yeah, I think, you know, in a missing persons case, there's so much mystery, isn't there? I can understand people uh, wanting to talk about it and wanting to um, understand what's happened. So I, I get that. But what is difficult is negative comments. Um, and, you know, my husband said to me, stop reading the comments, just stop reading them. But I, I, I couldn't, I kind of felt compelled to read them. And, you know, hearing people saying awful things about our family is, is, is difficult, you know, and, you know, of course, there's a lot of support as well. And the support is wonderful. And it's, it, and it really means a lot. But those negative comments can be so hurtful, because People don't know us and they don't know the situation. Stephen's parents remained under investigation for months after their arrests. In the end, no hard evidence linking them to any wrongdoing was ever found. Whilst the police still believe that Stephen has come to harm, there is no evidence to warrant any charges against his parents. The Clarks were overcome with relief but they struggled to distance themselves from the internet history that accused them of being involved in their son's disappearance. We've tried to sort of get life back to normal, but it will never go back to normal because all of those news reports are still out there. They're still in the media. If you Google um, Stephen or if you Google my parents, all this awful stuff 
and totally unfounded and unnecessary, all of this stuff comes up. And I feel very angry about it because what the police should have been doing is putting their resources on finding Stephen. And they didn't. The whole experience shattered the family's confidence in the authorities. I have lost all faith in the police. The police are the people that you are supposed to be able to go to when you need help or if you have a problem. And, you know, let's face it, you know, in a missing persons case, we all know that the police have a job to do. Um, And, you know, ultimately, I guess families are going to be under scrutiny when somebody disappears and goes missing. But the total lack of empathy and kindness and um, just that sort of you know, guilty until proven innocent type approach is unacceptable. What frustrated Victoria more than anything else was having this massive sudden influx of interest in her brother's disappearance, only for all of it to be aimed incorrectly at her parents. The one positive thing that could have come from all of that media attention would be actually finding out what happened to Stephen and where he was but it didn't, you know, all of that um, negative media attention and, um, and still no news of Stephen. Now, more than anything, Victoria wants to redirect the public's attention towards her brother. I want to set the record straight. You know, I want people to be searching for Stephen. I want them to know that he came from a good home, that he comes from a family that love him and care about him and just want him to come back. And implore anyone who knows anything to come forward. I would like to say to please come forward and, you know, just talk about anything that you might have seen or anything that you can remember about Stephen's disappearance. Because, you know, everybody who has a missing person says this, but it doesn't matter how insignificant you think it is, something might make sense and might be you know, a lead that can be followed up on. Um, Stephen being missing has left a huge hole in our lives. So anything that anyone can do to, um, to help us find him would be amazing. In many cases, it takes just one piece of information to lead police or family to the answers they crave. If you know what happened to Stephen, or you remember seeing someone like him on December the 28th, 1992, your information could be vital. Even if you've never heard of Stephen Clark before listening to this episode, you could still help. Visit our website, themissingpodcast.org, where you'll find more information on this and every other case we featured on this podcast. There, you can join an online movement, one dedicated to supporting the investigations for all the cases we've covered, including the one you're listening to right now. Since the launch of The Missing Podcast, over 300 volunteers have joined community investigation teams led by Locate International. In the UK alone, there are over 12,000 long-term missing and unidentified people. To support Locate's efforts and to learn more about the vital work they do, visit locate.international where you can join the mission to help locate the missing. The series is also made in collaboration with the charity Missing People, who work tirelessly to support the families of the missing. Their helpline is open to offer support and advice if you've been affected by anything in this episode. You can reach them by calling or texting 116000 or by emailing them at 116000 at missingpeople.org.uk. We cannot say this enough. It takes just one person with the right information to solve any of the cases in this series. Victoria hopes that the information will soon arrive to solve this one. The Missing is a podcast from Podomo and What's the Story Sounds. It's hosted by me, Pandora Sykes. The episodes are researched and produced by Jacka Kennedy. 
the executive producers for Podomo, are Jake Chudnow and Matt White. And the executive producers for What's the Story Sounds are Daryl Brown and Sophie Ellis. It's really intriguing, isn't it? So to listen to the rest of season five, search for The Missing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your podcasts. Once you've tapped follow for that show, don't forget to do the same for this show too, so you can find your next podcast. All my recommendations for the whole series will also be on Podcast Rex. That's at www.podcastrex.com. That is www.podcastrexrex.com. 